All right, so it's 9 a.m. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I just want to let you know ahead of time that the projector is having some issues yesterday and today, so if it cuts out, it's not my fault. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Libby V, What's a Unicorn Velociraptor? So if you were to enter that into Google, uh, you would see some results similar to this. Um, so the, the picture in the top left is the actual LibUV uh, logo, and then things just kind of go off the rails from there a little bit. Uh, we have a, a dinosaur riding a unicorn. For some reason, a Chicago Bears football player is on a dinosaur. Um, but yeah, so what I'm talking about is LibUV, the platform abstraction library that Node.js sits on top of. Uh, LibUV is written in C. Um, it's not C++, it's actually, I believe, C89. So it runs, you know, in most places. Um, the, the point of the library is to do asynchronous I.O. Uh, so it's going to be what gives LibUV, or I'm sorry, gives Node uh, its, you know, asynchronous I.O. operations, event loop, things of that nature. Uh, oh, here we go. Your fault. My fault? <laughs> That's all right. I'm glad I warned you guys ahead of time about that. All right, so LibUV is used by Node, obviously. Um, but it actually has a number of other really big consumers. So uh, a language called Julia, uh, NeoVim, CMake, um, a bunch of others. Um, at the bottom of the screen here, you will see a cartoon head. That is Saul. He is another one of the LibUV collaborators. That's his, his GitHub icon. Um, and he, he said this really nice quote to me one time, and I wanted to you know, attribute it correctly, not not take credit for the quote myself, but it basically is, we write the if defs so you don't have to. Um, so if you look inside the Node.js C++ code base, there, there is some branching, uh, some if defs based on what platform you're executing on, but it's really not that bad. Um, if you then dive down into the libuv source code, it's a whole other story. There are if defs all over the place. Um, there are actually two different source trees, one for Windows and then one for everything else. So there's there's a lot of branching logic there that, that kind of gives a nice, consistent API to people who want to build on top of LibUV. Um, and as I said, it is a cross-platform C library. So we, we support a large number of operating systems, um, some more than others. Uh, so we have a three-tiered support uh, system. Uh, so tier one is kind of, you know, we, we test this in the CI. Uh, anything that you know, might cause a regression on any of those platforms is going to block something from landing. Um, and then tier two is it's, it's considered officially supported. It might not necessarily be tested in the CI. Um, and we'll, we'll try to the best of our abilities to, to you know, make sure that it never breaks. Um, I'm not really sure why we have the distinction between tier one and tier two because I do believe that all of the things in Tier 2 are currently tested in the CI. Uh, and then Tier 3 is going to be community-maintained platforms. So that's going to be Android, uh, IBM I, although I think they're currently in the process of trying to add support, uh, you know, a higher tier of support right now. Uh, and then just some other you know, different random platforms. Uh, a lot of times, people will show up with platforms that I've never even heard of. and you know. They'll start trying to add if defs into the code and see how it works. So, you know, as long as it's not too intrusive into the code base, we're usually okay with that. Uh, but we can't really make any promises that it won't break because we're not testing it anywhere. So, if you, you know, if it's, if there's a platform you care about and you want to see it in there, you are kind of on the hook to make sure things don't break. So, some of the features that come from LibUV, uh, the event loop obviously is a really big one in Node. Uh, TCP sockets, so in Node that basically translates to the net module. Uh, we have DNS resolution, so uh, in the DNS module, a lot of the or some of the system calls are from a library called C Aries that I'll talk about on the next in a couple slides. 
um, but libuv also implements some stuff there. Uh, UDP sockets is going to be basically Node's DGRAM module. Um, file watching and file system operations, so just about everything in the FS module is going to go through libuv. Child processes uh, and threads, you know, obviously that translates to the child process module and worker threads. And then we have other things like synchronization primitives, uh, mutexes and things like that. Uh, and then we offer a high resolution clock. So if you know, date.now is just not accurate enough for you, you can use uh, inside of node process.hr time to get a little more high resolution timing. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about the high level architecture of LibUV. So I, li I like to think of this as broken up into two rows. So basically the top row, which has the network IO all the way across to like file IO, DNS, and user code. That's more of the public facing API, um, what users of LibUV are gonna consume. And then the bottom row with like the IOCP and the thread pool and things like that, that's more of the guts of LibUV. Uh, you can actually get pretty far using LibUV without having to interact with any of that stuff. Um, one of the things that's interesting on in the bottom row is uh, you know, IOCP is, is basically how we do IO polling on Windows, but we also have things like ePoll, KQ, <coughs> event ports. So uh, LibUV will basically pick the best, uh, I guess, primitives for what operating system you're running on. So KQ will be used on BSDs and the Mac. Uh, ePoll is used on Linux, and then event ports are uh, Solaris. So in order to really use LibUV effectively, there's a, a couple of things you have to understand, a few like concepts. Uh, the first one is handles. So these are an abstraction for what's typically a long-lived resource. So this might be something like a socket or a child process, um, TTYs if you're dealing with your terminal, timers and things like that. Uh, we also have a couple of different types of handles that are used for interacting with the event loop. So uh, something called an idle handle, uh, which is actually poorly named because it runs on every iteration of the event loop, so there's not really anything that's idle about it. Um, and then prepare and check handles, which run before and after you do, uh, before LibUV does its IO polling. Uh, and then async handles, which can you know, do things like be used to wake up the event loop if it's sleeping and things like that. Uh, and then handles have a concept of being active. So if a handle is active, it'll actually keep the event loop alive. Um, so for example, in Node, whenever you start a server, if you just, you know, you call server.start and nothing else, you'll notice that Node doesn't exit. That's because the event loop sees that there's at least one active handle alive and, or remaining and keep the event loop open. And then there's also an operation called unrefing. Um, and then the, the inverse of that is refing. So when a, a handle is created, it's in a state of being referenced, uh, and that is what will help you keep the event loop alive. But if you unref that, then the, the event loop no longer considers that as something that will keep your application open. Um, so these are actually exposed inside of Node. So if you've done a lot of Node programming, you, there's a chance you've seen dot .unref and dot .ref, um, and that's basically what it translates to down in libuv. So in addition to handles, we also have something called requests. Um, I like to think of handles as more of an object, whereas a request is more of a function or a method. Um, I say function or method because sometimes they are involved with a handle and sometimes they're kind of their own standalone thing. Uh, these are typically shorter lived operations. So things that happen when you're doing file IO, uh, if you're doing DNS lookups, um, or if the user passes in their own custom work that they want to execute in the thread pool, uh, then that's going to be a, more of a request type operation instead of a handle. Um, <clears throat> but like handles, they can also keep the event loop alive. Um, so for example, if you, you know, start node and you do fs.read file, um, it's, node's not going to terminate until that read operation is complete, if that's the only thing that's happening. Um, if, if, the, if the request wasn't something that could keep the event loop open, you would call fs read file and then the program would just exit immediately. So uh, if you're ever curious why it is that node doesn't exit in some cases, it's usually because there's a request or a handle somewhere. Uh, and then one of the more, I guess, famous things that we get out of libuv is the thread pool. So the whole point there is to move computations off of the main thread. Um, 
JavaScript as a language, with the exception of workers, which are relatively new, is single-threaded. So you know, in a, in a server application, you probably are going to have a lot of things going on at the same time. You could have you know, hundreds or thousands of requests being processed simultaneously. Um, and if everything ran on just the one main thread, things would slow down pretty quickly. Um, so we use the thread pool to offset some work onto you know, worker threads. Um, one common misconception is that everything runs in the thread pool. That's wrong. Uh, only file IO, uh, DNS lookups, so get address info and get name info, um, and then custom work that a user might actually off put into the thread pool. Uh, those are the only things that actually run in the thread pool. And uh, by default, there are four worker threads in the thread pool, uh, but you can actually control that with an environment variable called uh, UV underscore thread pool size. Uh, so if you pass that, to, uh, that's propagated up through Node too. So if you start Node with UV thread pool size equals you know, 124, that's how many threads you'll, you'll spawn. Um, unless you actually need to do this, you should probably be careful because uh, more threads are not always better. If you don't have enough hardware to keep up with all the threads, they can actually compete with one another and all the context switching in between them can actually slow your application down. Uh, so this, this picture is taken directly from the libuv documentation. It basically explains how the event loop works. So uh, every tick through the event loop, we calculate the loop time, so we have some reference for what time it is. Um, and this is kind of an expensive operation, so we cache it at the beginning, and then we are going to check is the loop alive or not. And by is the loop alive, I mean are there active handles and requests that um, are outstanding. If there are none, then the event loop can exit, and then you know, in Node, that'll propagate to the process exiting. Uh, but if there is still work to be done, there's a number of steps that, that libuv goes through. So first, it'll look and see if there are any timers that are due. So you know, if you've called set timeout or, or any of those like ready to, to be processed, um, from there it goes on to pending callbacks. So these are going to be your you know, in Node.js callbacks. Uh, it, it pretty much, we pass the functions down to libuv as well. So are there any callbacks that are ready to run? Um, next, it'll look for it'll process idle handles. These are the things that I said before had kind of a bad name um, because they get processed every time through the event loop. Uh, and then we do something called prepare handles. So this is uh, basically we're about to go into polling for I/O. Uh, prepare handles give you kind of a hook into the event loop if you want to do anything before polling for I/O. So then we move into the actual I/O polling, and then when we come out of that, we have check handles. So it's kind of the inverse of the prepare handle. Um, so these, that it gives you a good way to hook into your event loop. Uh, then finally, any closed callbacks that are outstanding, we execute and then we loop all the way back up to the top, uh, compute the time again, and, and basically start from scratch. And that is, that's basically one tick of the event loop. Um, this is all that I'm really going to cover on the event loop, but if you're interested in more about it, I would recommend Bert Belder's talk from 2016, uh, Node Interactive. It is you know, a, a few years old now, but the, the structure of the event loop hasn't changed, so the, the information there is still relevant. So next, I, want to talk, I talked a little bit about how libuv works. Now I want to talk about how it fits into to Node.js. So at the very top of this diagram, in yellow, I have, uh, that's going to be your application's JavaScript code. And then it's going to call down into Node's standard libraries, so you know the FS module, DNS, child process, all those, um, and that's going to be the the second layer of yellow there. From there, uh, it's going to call down into the purple layer, C++. That's the binding layer. It's really ugly code to kind of interface between you know JavaScript and V8 and libuv. Uh, and then the binding layer, I, I kind of listed some of the major libraries that are part of Node here. Um, I put libuv on the left by itself because it is you know, what we're talking about here. But in reality, I would say v8 is the biggest dependency, um, and then probably libuv. But you can see some of the other dependencies here. So uh, C Aries is a, uh, a uh, uh, DNS resolver. So you can actually, there, Node has two different ways to do DNS lookups. Uh, there is the way that goes through C Aries, which is always going to make a network request. And then there is <coughs> the, the, the one that libuv implements, which is going to be DNS lookup in Node. Um, 
That actually uses the system resolver, so it's going to use the same lookup mechanism as like ping and any other you know, applications you might be running on your computer. Uh, <clears throat> one thing to note about that is until, I don't know, about a year ago, it was actually possible that if you issued a bunch of DNS lookup requests that it would you know, go down into the thread pool. And so if you're doing like five, six, seven, eight DNS lookups, it could actually block other things in your application that were using the thread pool from running. So people would issue a bunch of DNS requests and then start doing file I.O. And they wouldn't understand why their file I.O. wasn't working. Um, it's because the threads were tied up with DNS lookups. Uh, so that's where it would be a good use case to use C-Aries because C-Aries doesn't go through the thread pool. Uh, but either way, that's no longer the case. So we've now, um, inside of LibUV, started to distinguish between different types of thread pool operations to make sure that they don't step on each other's feet too much. Uh, and then finally, at the bottom is just the operating system. Uh, LibUV calls out to that, but you know, for the purposes of this talk, it's not really important to think about. So uh, on this slide, Saul is back um, to talk about the Onion architecture, where basically, uh, the more layers that you peel away, the more you cry. And the reason for this is inside of Node, you might have used something like net.socket, which has a nice JavaScript API. It's built with streams and is just fairly easy to use. Um, but if you, look in, if you look closer at the source code, it references something called a TCP wrap, which is in purple. So it's one of those nasty binding layer objects. Uh, so this is written in C++. It's a lot less nice to work with. Um, and then that actually wraps something called a UV TCPT, uh, which is a libuv type uh, written in C for interacting with sockets. And then inside of libuv, we actually wrap that inside of an OS-specific handler, or OS-specific handle. So you know, a Windows socket or a Unix socket, things of that nature. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we test this thing. So we had issues in the past uh, where you know, we, would run, we would create a, a release of libuv, and you know, all the test suite would pass, and then we would go to update node, and then all of a sudden you know, things would break inside of node. Um, libuv has close to 400 tests, uh, but they're written in C. C is kind of a pain to, to deal with. I mean, I think we're mostly JavaScript developers in this room. Um, so it's, it's tedious, and like I said, we had issues where, for example, libuv119 came out, um, everything was fine, went to upgrade node, and the CI you know, came back red, so we didn't actually land that. But unfortunately, there are people in the community who, as soon as a new libuv release comes out, they build with that version, you know, they compile node with that version of libuv themselves. So even though we hadn't strictly broken Node, it, we did break some users um, who were you know, a little more brave. Um, and so we, we very quickly reverted and got a new, uh, a new version released. And you know, life was good again. But it was, it was an issue that happened more than once. And it was kind of frustrating to deal with. So we kind of thought about it for a little bit. And we're trying to figure out a good way to, to make sure you know, that Node was going to be fine before we actually made a libuv release. And so the, the build, Node.js build working group stepped up big time for us there. Uh, they actually created a new CI job where before we create a libuv release, we actually take whatever is the latest in Node and whatever is the latest in libuv, uh, compile them together, and then run Node's test suite and see what happens. Um, so Node has you know, over 2,800 tests. Uh, it's easy to write tests in Node because they're JavaScript. Um, and ever since we kind of took this approach, we haven't had any issues where you know, there, there have been bugs, but we haven't had any of those known regressions that cause us to do cycles of multiple releases. So that's been a nice uh, process improvement. So now I want to uh, actually trace through uh, thread pool operations, so all the way from user land JavaScript code all the way down to the thread pool. Um, so in this case, we're just going to do a copy file operation. So we're going to use fs.copy file. Uh, there's three different variations of that. So there's the synchronous version, uh, the promises-based version, and then a callback-based version. And so the, the first one shown here is the synchronous version. Uh, second is promises, and then the one at the bottom is the old school callback uh, based approach. Uh, 
So from the code that we just saw, the first thing that would happen is we would call into Node's FS module. Um, in this case, I'm showing the code for the promises-based version because it's just it fits nicely on a slide a little better. Um, but you know, if you look inside Node, there's similar code for synchronous and callback versions. Um, but so all we're doing here is we're passing in source, the destination, so you know where we're going to copy the file to, and then certain flags that that uh, the operation takes. So for an example, flag would be you know if the file exists already, do we want to overwrite it or not? Things like that. Uh, we're going to validate both the source and destination paths inside of Node. Uh, the flags we're going to make sure that the flag is an integer. So that's what the or zero is. That's kind of a uh, JavaScript trick. Um, JavaScript doesn't really have different types of numbers, but under the hood, the JS engine does. So the OR0 will actually convert it to a uh, signed 32-bit integer under the hood. And then we're going to call binding.copy file and pass in the, the you know, normalized paths, the flags, and then a special symbol here called k use promises. This is just a symbol that um, under the hood will tell the binding layer that we're doing a promises operation as opposed to synchronous or uh, callbacks. And so if you look through the node code base, these are the three different ways that we would call binding.copy file. Uh, you'll notice that the first three parameters in every case um, are the source, destination, and flags, because that's going to be the data that we're operating on. Um, but then the, you know, the remaining arguments differ between the implementations. Uh, so I already mentioned k use promises is a symbol that tells you to use pr the promises implementation. Um, the the synchronous version passes undefined followed by a context. The context is what will be populated with any results and errors that might come back from the binding layer. Um, and then the callback based version just passes something called rec, which is a a, a C plus plus object that's used for in the callback code. So from here, we're going to be leaving JavaScript. We're going to be entering the, the really ugly C++ code that I talked about a, a little bit. Um, can everybody in the back read that? Not that it's nice code, but. Uh, so this is actually the C++ code that gets executed anytime you run copy file. Uh, the first you know, collection of statements, uh, you'll see a bunch of check GE, check not null, things like that. These are basically a last ditch effort to validate user input. Um, if any of these checks fail, Node will hard crash. Um, and we're okay with that for a couple reasons. First off, you're really not supposed to be using the binding layer directly. So if, if in your code you're calling this directly, then it, you know, you're kind of on your own. Um, the other reason is we have already done, we've already validated all these same things in JavaScript, so we're just trying to make sure that you know, people aren't going to be passing in garbage data to us. Uh, from there, we're actually going to then call something called get rec wrap, uh, and that is how what we're going to be able to use to determine uh, it, what type of operation it's going to be. So synchronous, asynchronous, and then if it is asynchronous, is it callbacks or promises? Um, and I'm not going to go too much into what all these different arguments are because you can see there's there's you know a lot of them, uh, but you'll see that copy file is there. You'll see the source and the destination, the flags. Um, and then most importantly, you'll see uv underscore fs underscore copy file. That's the function inside of libuv that this operation is going to execute. So from here, we're actually going to be leaving Node completely and going into libuv. Um, and this is that same function that I just mentioned. This is uh, what the signature looks like. So the first parameter is going to be the event loop. Um, for synchronous operations, that can actually be null, but uh, it'll be there in all the calls. The, the rec. The second parameter is uh, it's going to be basically a file system operation request. So you know earlier I talked about handles and requests. This is one of those requests. Um, so Node's not really responsible for attaching all of the information to the request. There are some macros down later in this code that I'll go over that kind of populate that some more. Um, but then the source and destinations are passed as path and new path. Uh, the same flags that we gave in JavaScript are passed as the flags. And then the UVFS uh, callback, that's going to be either a callback function or null if it's synchronous. Uh, from there, we're going to call init. So init is a macro. Um, it's going to populate that request that I talked about with, it's going to basically tell the request that this is a copy file operation. So everybody who calls into libuv doesn't have to specify what operation they're running. It'll just you know, automatically know by the, the function that you call. Um, 
Then we do some, some flag validation. So we want to make sure that you know, people aren't passing in garbage values in the C layer, too. Um, so if anyone passes in a, a flag that we don't recognize, we'll return E and val. Uh, next, we do cap, FS capture path. The point of this function is to basically take the path that was passed in and make a copy of it, because if we're doing an asynchronous operation, there's a chance that that, that memory could be freed by the time the, the operation completes. If that happens, you're probably going to run into a hard crash. Um, and then finally, we, we add the flags to the request, and then we call post. So post is another macro that um, is going to send your work off to the thread pool. Um, it's worth pointing out this is the actual full implementation on Windows. Uh, there are similar ones on, on Mac and uh, Linux. Um, but because the Windows code is a little smaller and cleaner, I'm, I'm going with that. Uh, so this is what the post macro looks like. Uh, basically, it, it checks the callback if it's null or not, so it knows if it's synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, and then if it's asynchronous, it's going to register the request with the event loop. So once it does that, it, it'll keep your, your uh, process alive if the, while the work is still happening. And then it'll call work submit, which basically takes you know, your request and sends it off to the thread pool. Um, you'll see UVFS work is one of the parameters. That's basically a giant switch case where it looks at what type of operation you're trying to run and then you know, calls whatever the code that you need to call for that. And then UVFS done is what's going to be called once the work is complete in the thread pool. That'll basically propagate you back to the binding layer and then back up to JavaScript. Um, if you're using a synchronous operation, we just call UVFS work directly. So it'll do the copy, um, and then it'll just return the results directly because we don't really need to involve the thread pool if we're blocking. So this is the Windows uh, internal copy file implementation. Uh, we're, again, going to do some flag validation. This is going to be operating, uh, operating system specific flag validation um, because certain things are supported on Unix and Mac that aren't supported on Windows. Uh, and then you'll see the copy file W call. That's actually a Windows API call that will handle the copy for you. Uh, and then the rest of the code at the bottom is uh, because of a little bug on Windows where it'll return E busy if you're trying to copy the same source and destination. So we try to do the, the copy operation. If it fails with E busy, then we stat both of, the, both of the files. And if it's the same, then we know the operation actually succeeded um, and it's not a, a genuine error. But from there, uh, we're basically you know, going to go back up the stack. So we'll go back to the, uh, we'll exit the event loop, go back up to the binding layer, back up into JavaScript. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about the possibility of a libuv 2.0. So this has kind of been an, an ongoing thing for a while. Uh, libuv 1 was released in 2014. So it's now, what, five years old? Um, the project has been API and ABI stable since then with a few, you know, basically a few oopses on our side. Um, but in, in order to do some cleanup that we'd like to do and add some new features that are breaking changes, we would have to bump up to 2.0. Uh, the problem with that is at this point, that would be a rather large, like, delta. Um, but also, we have a small team, so there are, you know, hundreds of people collaborating on Node. Um, I'd say there's less than 10 collaborating on LibUV. So it's, it's a pretty big support job for the people who are working on LibUV to support a, a 1x and a 2.0. Uh, even though some projects out there are already actually using the, the, the fake 2.0. So we have v1x, which is what Node and most people are using. And then the master branch in GitHub is what would be the 2.0. Um, I think Julia Lang, at least, is already using that. Um, but you know we've. We've been going back and forth on this for over a year now, and we're starting, I think we're starting to come around to the idea of just staying on V1 forever. There's you know, something to be said for stability and things like that. Um, it would avoid extra work on Node side of having to create you know, APIs and N APIs so that, so that libuv changes wouldn't break Node add-ons and things like that. Um, so I think now we're leaning more towards you know, 1.x forever. But we are still adding a bunch of new features. So this is just uh, some of them that have landed in the past year. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the ones that I, I guess, depending on your use case, could be a big feature is the maximum thread pool size has been increased. So you know, by default, it's still going to be four threads. 
but you, if you really need it, you can bump it up to 1,024 threads. Uh, prior to that change, the maximum that you could do was 128. Um, people have made the case that you know, as computers continue to get better, we can run more threads. Uh, we've added something called UV random. Um, so this is going to be LibUV's answer to generating cross-platform random numbers. Um, uh, UDP connected sockets are a new thing. So uh, you know, UDP sockets, you generally think of, you just kind of broadcast your messages out and maybe it'll be received, maybe it won't. Uh, but it's actually possible to connect a, a, a UDP socket <clears throat> so that anytime you do the send, it'll always send to the same destination. Uh, we've added UV OS uname, so if you're interested in getting more information about you know, what platform you're running on, that's going to that's gonna be useful there. Um, and then we've actually taken that and Node's OS module is now built on top of that. Uh, UV get constrained memory is interesting. So one of the problems that uh, people have is, you know, Especially V8 would set its, uh, its memory limit to like, you know, a certain amount of memory, like whatever is available on the computer. But some operating systems like Linux have things called C groups, um, and then there can be other, you know, right now we only look at C groups, but in the future it could be expanded to other things, where you can actually impose artificial memory constraints on your application. And so if something like V8 would try to use all of the system memory, it's not going to be able to do that anyway. Um, so UV get constrained memory lets you actually query the operating system to see how much memory you're allowed to use. So that's a, a, a useful one. Um, threads can now actually set what they want their stack size to be. Um, so that's just a, a little tweak for, you know, if you know how much memory you're going to need, you can configure that. Um, a really big one was streaming reader. So this request goes back like five years. Uh, Node has fs.reader, but under the hood that actually calls scander, and that buffers all of the requests at once. So you could see if you're trying to read a very large directory how you could run into memory issues. Um, so people have wanted streaming reader. We had a pull request that changed hands like three or four times, um, and then it was also targeted at the master branch. So within the past year, we actually you know, got that under control, got it targeting the V1X branch, and we're able to get it landed. And you know, as of a couple months ago, it's now shipping in Node. Um, and then just UV uh, get time of day. This is the, uh, you know, basically the, the C equivalent of date.now. Um, and UV FS MKS temp, so it's a, a call to make um, a temp file for your application. And then I wanted to finish up with just uh, one thing that's, I guess, tangentially related to LibUV, um, but it's my talk, my rules, so I want to talk about it. Um, it's called UV WASI. So WASI is the WebAssembly system interface. Uh, it's relatively new. It came out within the past year. Um, and it basically gives WebAssembly applications a way to access the underlying operating system, because uh, by default, uh, WebAssembly code is sandboxed. Um, so, I, you know, as a LibUV maintainer, when I first heard about WASI, I was like, oh, that sounds like LibUV for, for WebAssembly. I was like, let me try to build that. So I did. I built it on top of LibUV for, you know, maximum portability. Um, and then as of Node 13.3, which, I don't know, came out in the past month or so, um, it's shipping in Node. So there's documentation. You can do require WASI and, and play around with that if you want. Um, hoping to do more work on that in the future. The, the GitHub repository is shown on the slide. Um, WASI.dev is the kind of homepage for WASI. So if you're interested in WebAssembly or anything like that, I encourage you to go play around with that. And that is all that I have. Thank you.